So I, I want to talk to you today about the future of the internet. This is a topic that has been a bit of an obsession of mine for a little while now. In the summer of 2018, I decided I wanted to look at the history of the digital future to get a sense of how we arrived with the internet that we have today, how we arrived at the present. I did that by spending my summer in the library. I went to GW's library and checked out every issue of Wired Magazine and read 25, issues, 25 years of it, cover to cover. I wrote about that for the magazine's 25th anniversary issue that October. Reading through Wired Magazine gave me an opportunity to understand what the digital revolution looked like as it was arriving. There was a lot that they got right. They could see that something was new about our communications technologies. There was also a lot that they got wrong. There was a sense of inevitability in their discussion of the digital future. There was a sense that these new communications technologies were going to level the differences within society. Information was going to be free, and surely humanity would soon follow. The internet was going to make Bill Gates a trillionaire, but that was okay, because it was going to make all of us millionaires. The new economy would no longer be weighted down by all the limitations of traditional economics. So I wanted to read Wired Magazine to get a sense of what we usually get right and what we get wrong when we talk about the future. I want to share today a bit of what I've learned and what I think it means for the next steps of the internet. Now I'll tell you, what brings me to this project is fundamentally that I'm kind of a worrier. I spent 15 years in the leadership of a national environmental group, the Sierra Club. And coming out of the environmental movement, there's a an old saying that we have, that environmentalists are the only people predicting the future who hope that we're wrong. So let me quickly take you through just an abbreviated history of the digital future. Those of you who are at GW, I teach a whole class on this. The 1990s was the traditional web 1.0. This was Netscape. This was the dot-com boom, when all of a sudden it seemed like this internet and email was unleashing, unlocking potential everywhere. That then culminated in the dot-com crash when it turned out that all of those digital bits flying around weren't immune to the limitations of traditional economics. Then in the 2000s, the internet got exciting again. There was Wikipedia, there was the blogosphere, YouTube. It was an internet of us. Communities were coming together, engaging online, forming movements, creating art. We were seeing this wonderful mass participation. Then the iPhone arrived and fundamentally changed the way we engage with the internet. When it arrived, they called it the Jesus phone. They were kind of right. Smartphones changed how we engage with the internet. Again, throughout the 2000s, they talked about how there's an inevitability to how this is going to change everything. And the world we're building because of the internet is just going to be better. Then reading through it, you get into the 2010s. And in the 2010s, what we notice is kind of a, a slowdown of the pace of digital innovation. The big platforms that we all know today and have known for a decade came to dominate. Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon. Instead of facing competitors, they tended to acquire the competitors. There was also just a general sense that these firms and the internet had stopped being the scrappy upstarts creating the future and instead were responsible for the president. That then led to the tech lash in 2016, which we've been living through ever since. We had about five or six years now of looking at these companies, recognizing, as uh, Mark Andreessen said, that software has eaten the world but also treating these tech companies as titans and holding them responsible for the present instead of just crediting them with the future. 
This project has been on my mind a lot recently because over the past year, suddenly Silicon Valley is trying to turn the corner on the tech lash. And they're trying to talk about the next chapter of the internet's history again. So we now have Silicon Valley folks talking a lot about artificial intelligence, particularly artificial general intelligence, which is gonna be breakthroughs in machine learning and neural nets that could radically transform society. They are doing some tremendous things right now. Though artificial intelligence, we hoped, was going to really change things for the COVID pandemic and how we responded to it in medical uh, services, it wasn't ready for that yet. There's a lot that it still wasn't ready for. There's also the blockchain revolution. Cryptocurrencies, their supporters will tell you that this can fundamentally rewrite the internet routing around the big tech corporations and ushering in a new era of Web3. And then there's the metaverse, a hardware upgrade to how we engage with the internet, a one-to-one -one mapping of the entire physical world into a digital space. So that through virtual reality and augmented reality, we can now engage with each other in massively different ways. These are three different visions and their promoters will tell you, each of them will tell you, that these are inevitable. Now, I'm gonna take a step back here. This is Douglas Adams' third book in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. It's actually six books in the trilogy now. Nonetheless, it's a great trilogy. Uh, writing in 1982, his third book, Douglas Adams spoke about what he calls an SCP. An SCP is something that, can't, that you can't see, or don't see, or our brain doesn't let us see because we think that it's somebody else's problem. That's what SCP means, somebody else's problem. The brain just edits it out. It's like a blind spot. Now I mention this because it's been my, on my mind increasingly, listening to the evangelists of Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurs and the engineers and the funders. Because there's a fourth future that I think we all desperately hope is not inevitable. This is an article that was in Wired Magazine in January 2020, just before the COVID pandemic occupied all of our attention. Wired Magazine, the host of the digital future, started talking about the pyrocene, that we had entered the age of fire. This was because of the wildfires in Australia, but it could just as easily have been because of the wildfires in California. Last summer, a heat dome descended on the Pacific Northwest in the United States. People died as a result. Climate change is no longer a problem of the future. It is a problem of right now. And I don't need to tell you, the audience, this. We all know this because we've been hearing it as a drumbeat for years. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released another report recently telling us that one and a half degrees of warming is already locked in. But if we have a whole of society response to climate, then maybe we can head off two degrees of warming or even worse. This is a tweet that I wrote about a week ago. This tweet is basically the summation of this entire talk. The IPCC told, has told us we need a whole of society mobilization in the next decade to decarbonize and prevent global collapse. This must be priority one for everyone with any type of power. And Silicon Valley has effectively responded to that by saying, well, we burned down two rainforests teaching a neural net to draw pictures. Does that help? Think about those three futures again. Artificial intelligence relies on these uh, large networks of, compu of computers in order to do things that we as humans can already do. It is incredible some of the things that AI can now do. You can feed into a, a program called DAL-E. Uh, you can feed it a description of what picture you want and it can generate that picture. That's fascinating. It's also incredibly energy intensive and wasteful. How is that a solution for us right now? Bitcoin, the New York Times reported recently, the Bitcoin network burns more energy than the country of Finland. 
and while other cryptocurrencies can be a little less wasteful. Creating a trustless architecture to replace the institutions that currently dominate the internet, while it seems like a nice thing to do, is in no sense an answer to the question that we all collectively face right now. The metaverse, when we think about a one-to-one -one data layer for, that we can all engage with around the entire world, the race to build that data layer, the race to build the metaverse and profit from it is a race that will not be concluded based on who burns the least carbon. Back in 2011, there's a Facebook engineer named Jeff Hammerbacher who said, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. That sucks. I always loved that quote. But today in 2022, it occurs to me that the best minds of my generation, at least the ones gathered in Silicon Valley, the engineers, the entrepreneurs, the evangelists, they are thinking about how to build artificial intelligence. They're thinking about how to build new cryptocurrency outlets and Web3. They're thinking about how to build a metaverse. They are treating climate change as somebody else's problem. And that also sucks. So if there's a lesson that I have taken away from my study of the digital future, it is that nothing is inevitable. We have choices about what we're going to believe, what we're going to build, and what world we're going to live in. Technology alone is not going to solve the climate crisis. This is not a problem that is Silicon Valley's alone to face. But over the past 30 years, Silicon Valley has become the center of the global economy. And with that great power, as with Spider-Man, comes great responsibility. What we should all hope for, what we should all demand when we think about the next chapter of the internet is that the people building it do not treat the climate crisis as somebody else's problem. Thank you. Thank you.